Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's ninth meeting of 2018. There are no apologies. Agenda item number one is a decision on taking item three in private, which is consideration of our approach to scrutiny of the management of Offenders Scotland Bill at stage one. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are all agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on remand focusing on the decision-making process around the use of bail and remand in Scotland. The committee has previously held two sessions on remand on 16th, and 16th January and 6th February. Today's session is the first of three further evidence sessions to further explore the issues that have been raised. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. The purpose of today's evidence session is to explore further the decision-making process around the use of bail and remand in Scotland. And I welcome Sheriff Lido, Sheriff of Edinburgh and Lothian and the Borders and President of the Sheriff's Association. And can I thank you, um, Sheriff Lido, for your written submission, which is always very he helpful. Uh, and sets out the, the views of the Sheriff's Association. And it's probably worth pointing out that um, in Sheriff Liddell's submission, um, paragraph three is um, just emphasised that the Sheriff's Association is a judicial body and does not debate on matters of politi political controversy. And if I could perhaps start the line of questioning Sheriff Liddell, with um, a question as to what you consider to be the barriers um, or the, um, to what extent, well, for example, the committee is aware of the possible reasons for remanding a person in custody, including concerns that the person will, if released on bail, fear to appeal in court engage in criminal activity or interfere with witnesses. So I suppose the question is to what extent do these and other particular grounds feature in decisions to remand people in bail in practice in the courts? Uh, what I would do, I think, is draw the, um, the committee's attention to the terms of section 23b and c of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act <clears throat> which I think was fairly recently amended. And I, it may seem fairly simple and straightforward, but what we do is apply the law that's made by the politicians. You will see it's 23B uh, that there must be good reasons uh, for refusing bail, as would be entirely appropriate, and that uh, public interest and public safety are particularly mentioned in the, the legislation. Uh, we then go on to 23C, uh, which sets out pretty comprehensively the grounds that are relevant to the question of bail. And on each and every occasion when bail is applied for, this is a checklist that we go through in relation to considering whether bail should be, someone should be admitted to bail or not. Now, of course, that's a, a statutory checklist. We also have to take into and it's our part of the equation. We have to take into account the personal circumstances, and those are all different. That's why a robot couldn't do the exercise, because we have to take into account, you know, well, there's such a myriad of things. It would be to the exclusion of some to mention others that we have to take into account. We'll be digging down as we go on with our questioning as well. That's the statutory considerations. As you say, every case is on its own merit. And there may well be a pattern that is formed um, with certain individuals who seem to repeat and, and, and um, are on remand certain people in, in certain circumstances that seem to always be on remand. But perhaps as we develop our line of questioning, then that will be flushed out. Liam Kerr. Good morning, Sheriff. Uh, just to, to follow on from that uh, same point, during previous sessions uh, into this area, we, we've been told that there's a lack of robust data on why judges are deciding to use remand in the individual cases. So I can understand from what you've said to the convener, here's what we have to consider. But there doesn't appear to be data on 
which were the main considerations and what the conclusions were. Are you able to tell me why? Well, first of all, if, if I may, it, there isn't a separate issue of remand. There's only a question of whether bail is to be admitted or not. And so the, the remand is, is the expression that's been used, but uh, I think it's worth keeping in mind that we apply the statutory criteria. So far as data is concerned, you will see within the, uh, the uh, statute itself that we require to give reasons for admitting to bail or for refusing bail. So there is data, if anyone cares to collect it, available in every single consideration of bail. So the, um, is it fair to say, then, that the, the breakdown, if I can put it that way, is in the collation of the data? The data exists, in your view. It's that nobody has actually collated it up to this point. Uh, well, I don't know, because it's certainly it's, it, it's not something I would do. Mm -hmm. It's not something uh, the Sheriff's Association would do, because there's no point in doing that. Each case is, is decided on its own merits to some extent. Now, there may be similarities in the consideration, for example, if someone is, is a, a repeat offender or if they've repeatedly breached bail conditions, then that might be something that recurs in a number of cases. But the personal circumstances change. But I, I return to the fact that it's, it's a statutory requirement to provide reasons for bail or, or refusal. Just uh, sticking with the records, uh, in a previous session we heard from Community Justice Scotland uh, and what they told this committee was that legislation requires that when bail is granted or refused, a record should be kept of that. I'm aware that that happens in some cases and not in others. Do you concede that it happens in some cases and not in others? And if so, how is that possible? Well, no, I don't, but it's not a question I can answer because it's, it has to, I come back to it, reasons have to be given. It is a requirement, and as far as I'm concerned, reasons will be given in uh, each case where bail is refused or someone is admitted to bail. Be your view that Community Justice Scotland uh, appear to be mistaken? I, I don't see any reason why they can't get their hands. Well, well, I don't know if they can get their hands on that, but all I can say is, for every case, reasons exist and they have to be given by the sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Could I perhaps tease this out a little bit? Is it not the case that reasons are given orally um, if the judge is going to withdraw or refuse bail, but if there's an appeal, there is um, a written record of the reasons and this written record is retained? I, it's a bit of both. Uh, reasons are given orally. I think, and, and I, I need to check this, but my understanding is that the uh, clerk of court is obliged to uh, keep a record. It goes into the minute of the reasons for bail or refusal of bail. Now, that may be fairly shorthand. If an appeal is uh, lodged, then there are more substantial reasons. I, I suppose a, a, an expansion of those reasons is set out because an appeal means that the sheriff has to write a note for the uh, appeal court. Can I perhaps refer you to the submission from the senators of the College of Justice? And um, it says, reasons will be given orally by the judge in court in any decision to refuse or withdraw bail. Judges only provide written reasons when a bail appeal is lodged, and that's section 32, 3C of the Criminal Proceedings Act 1985. And any report will be retained with the, the bail appeal papers it's um, not with the indictment, so I suppose you'd really have to know where to look at it. So would it be your, your, your position it might be helpful, because we can learn so much from data, it would be helpful if there was also a written um, record of the reasons for withdrawal or refusal of bail in the first instance? Well, I think there is. That, what, what's being said there, and I agree with that, is if there's an appeal, then a judge will write a note but the record of what happens in court, the minute that's kept by the clerk of court, is a different thing altogether. And the clerk has to write down whether the bill is refused or uh, has been granted. Right. I've just got some further information from the clerks, which said that we asked uh, the Scottish courts. 
Um, and they said that reasons are given, but there's no obligation on the clerk to record them. So perhaps there should be an obligation, so there is a written record available? Uh, that's a political question. Ah. But, uh, is it a I political don't, don't question? I'd be, I, or, I'd be oh. inclined to answer. I, I, so far as... Um, so far as reasons are, you know, reasons are concerned, if, uh, looking to the practicality, if I make a decision on bail, I give my reasons there and then, yeah. and that's subject to appeal. So if I've, if I've got it wrong, or if I'm considered to have got it wrong, you know, the, uh, I, and there can be an appeal on both sides, as I'm sure you're all aware, then that's a matter which will require me to write a note and extended reasons. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be responsible for suggesting that uh, there's more um, pressure placed upon clerks to write uh, more and more into a minute each time a case calls in court, because frankly that would actually, that, that would take up a lot of time and would, be, would have a resource implication. But it would. Um, provide somewhere that information was available if you were coming to look at someone before you, you looked at the notes, you could see quite clearly, and there was a written uh, evidence from a previous judge um, about why bail had been refused or withdrawn. Would that not be helpful for you? To whom? What to you, been, when what? you were looking at this person's record had been, and you were deciding this? Oh, oh, looking at a previous decision? Yeah. Oh, no. Not at all. No, no, no I have to look at a decision fresh. I, I can't uh, take into account. Or what when they've been done. charged but they're awaiting sentence. Well, that information, the, the, the way it works, I'm not sure I'd, I'd explain exactly what happens in court. If, when the question comes up, a question of bail comes up, and the Crown wants to oppose bail, then the Crown will provide. Uh, a, a notice of previous convictions, which doesn't stay with the court papers. It's, it's only handed up and then taken back. And so at that point in time, the, the court would become aware of the uh, convictions that a person might already have. Up until that point in time, it would be entirely inappropriate for the court to be aware of previous convictions, which might happen if you know about a previous decision that's been made. If there was a, a gap between being found guilty and sentencing and the question of bail came up? In, in those circumstances, the, yes, the, the uh, papers would remain, the, uh -huh. the previous convictions remain with the papers. And would that be helpful then to know the reasons in, in another case why it had been refused? Because it, it, it wouldn't influence the case, the, it's already <coughs> been... Um, decided. It's just yeah. a pending sentence. I don't think so. Uh -huh. And I, I think I may, those who are making that decision might be criticised for taking into account something that they shouldn't take into account. Because what, what, what we are um, faced with at the point of making a decision on uh, bail is background material in relation to previous convictions. So, so we can see if someone has been convicted, for example, if someone's a repeated housebreaker, and you can see from the, if you look at the convictions, it's quite easy to see whether they've committed further offences whilst on bail, so whilst they've been on trust. It's not very difficult to read through, to understand the, the, the data that's included in the um, previous convictions. But what I then have to take into account are, is the snapshot in time of the personal circumstances of the individual. And I might be taking into account previous. I might be allowing myself to be influenced by the decision of another sheriff if I look at what happened on a previous occasion. And I think I'd have serious uh, discomfort about uh, going through an exercise where I looked at what a sheriff had done before and followed that lead when I'm supposed to look at it afresh. I'm just wondering if there would be personal things like, you know, this difficult to, to get, this person is homeless. And then there's a thread of, well, this homelessness perhaps causing the breach or, you know, it'll be on, if that's the kind of way I'm thinking. But uh, Liam Kerr, I think you want to come in again.
Just very briefly, from my own understanding, if you would please, Sheriff, um, when you, uh, looking at record keeping, when you promulgate an oral decision, when you say this is uh, on whether to grant or refuse bail, what obligation is there on the court to keep a record in the same way as we would have an official record kept here? If, if you see what I mean, presumably the clerk is writing down the significant points, but is there a separate obligation on the court to record everything that happens in that court? If it's a summary matter, then it's not recorded. Understand. And so there's no uh, digital record of it. If it's a solemn matter, then everything's recorded. Uh, staying away from small uh, term politics, I've been pushing for many years to have digital recording in all courts at all times, but so far haven't had much success. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Liam MacArthur, supplementary. Yeah. I can certainly understand the, the rationale um, behind the need to take each case on its on its own merits and, and I think quite rightly your concerns about um, decisions being influenced by, by matters out with the determination on, on a single case. I, I think as we'll probably come on to, to uh, discuss um, shortly in relation to um, alternatives um, uh, to remand, um, having an evidential base that would show there's a pattern of decisions um, in terms of bail that seem to suggest there's a lack of confidence in um, in, in alternatives within a, uh, within a sheriffdom may be more easy um, to, to dissect and, and, and to interpret on the back of having the sorts of information that the, the convener was suggesting um, might take place through the through the clerk's minute. Is that is that not a, a perhaps a, a more useful um, deployment of, of, of that requirement upon clerks to record the, the justification for refusal or, or withdrawal of bail? I don't think that we have a difficulty in having information before us. I, I think there's adequate information from what we are told by um, if, if, if the Crown wants to rely upon and chooses to rely upon su such a history, if it's relevant, then it's uh, open to the Crown to put that forward when they oppose bail. And they sometimes do. We'll put forward a, a number of things and say this individual has uh, breached bail on half a dozen occasions. Sometimes you can see that from the record, depending on whether they've been prosecuted for a breach of bail or they've just breached it. And it hasn't led to a prosecution of Section 27 1B. And so that, that information is made available usually at the hand of the Crown in the court on the day in question. And on the other hand, you might hear from the, a solicitor, a defence solicitor, who will say, well, that's all very well, but the circumstances have changed. He's uh, got the offer of uh, employment for the first time with uh, an uncle, and that starts in a week's time, and he wouldn't be able to take that up. He's just got a tenancy that uh, has started, has been asked for a tenancy for years, been homeless. These are the sort of things that regularly crop up and we have to take into account. So we're fed a lot of information there and then from antagonistic sides, uh, admittedly. Mm -hmm. But I don't really see uh, what... I, I, can, I can feel there's an appetite <laughs> for uh, a, a written record. And... Uh, Perhaps that's because data is uh, something that uh, is looked upon as being important. But what I can't say is that we would find it very useful when it comes to a question of bail. As I say, I think I was more driving at the fact that um, if, there were a, if there were a pattern of decisions that seemed to be taken in relation to refusal of, of, um, of, of bail, um, because there were concerns about the, the public safety requirements or whatever it may be, then it may be possible then to look at what provision there is in relation to um, housing for homeless or support services yes. or whatever. So in a sense, it's less a decision um, for yourselves or, or colleagues and, and for the court and more a, a decision for other services um, that would be then, I think, under more pressure to, um, to, to, to up their game in terms of what they're, that they're providing. I think here perhaps I would make reference to what was said by the Chief Inspector of Prisons when uh, he suggested, and I thought it was ill judged, that uh, sheriffs were heavy handed uh, in relation to the question of bail. And I think he meant by that heavy handed in relation to refusal of bail. But if one looks at what he's suggesting, uh, he suggests that uh, refusal of bail should only be used in exceptional cases. I think he says, but it's absolutely necessary 
to protect the public from serious harm or where there's clear evidence of a flight risk. Now, it's, it's open to uh, the legislator to change what's contained in section 23C. And uh, sheriffs will simply apply it. That's what we do. And it's, it, it is perfectly uh, reasonable to think that if you uh, reduce the criteria that you uh, provide for sheriffs to take into account when considering bail, then you can alter, of course, the amount of people that get admitted to bail and the amount of people that are remanded. And that will have consequences either way. But it's, it's not a question that I can really address. Daniel, supplementary. I want to go back to some, uh, a couple of your, your previous answers. Uh, you, you know, Margaret Mitchell um, set out a, a number of submissions that we've had, uh, which suggest that, that, that uh, essentially the reasons for not granting bail aren't recorded. But uh, can, I, can I just clarify with you whether or not you agree with that statement or not? Because I was far from clear from, by your, with your answers on that. I thought there was more uh, of a recording done, so I, that rather than just admitted to bail or refused. But you don't know whether it is or not recorded? It is recorded that, well... No, I, I'm, I'm sorry, do you know or not? I would have to, I, I, I understand the question, I'd have to go and look at minutes, because yeah. my understanding was that there is a recording of some sort. It might not be... I, uh, I find it rather alarming one. that you're not sure whether that's recorded or not. Do you, do you not think it, it's pretty important that reasons for not granting bail are a matter of public record? It's a public court. It's open to the public. Yeah, but so it I, I'm should not, be recorded, I'm, should it not? Well, it can be recorded by anyone in the court. I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy about the level of criticism that's being uh, levelled here, because it's not a secret what goes on in the court. These are, it's a public hearing. Excuse me, Sheriff, but this is a very serious matter. We're it talking about indeed. people being deprived of their liberty. And I think it's a fundamental point of principle that if people are being deprived of their liberty, those reasons are a matter of record, a record that can be interrogated. And so far, we're not clear from your evidence whether that's being recorded or not. I, I think that's very serious. Do you not think that's serious? You're entitled to a view of whether you think that's serious. I'm not here to make political comment. So, so to, to, to ask me where I think that's serious, I, the system that's, that exists, as you no doubt know, is a system whereby a dis decisions are made, many, many decisions are made in busy courts, day in and day out. Reasons required to be given and reasons are given in open court. But the question is whether the record is, and then whether or not those decisions can then be interrogated as a matter of data. Um, you know, and, and I think one of the other key things I'd like to do, you, you do understand the difference between record and data. Um, statistical um, information is different from, from record. Statistical information is information which is gathered at the aggregate level, can be interrogated at the aggregate re level rather than in individual cases. Now, uh, firstly, do you understand the difference and do you understand the need to have that aggregate data so that we can look at what is happening at a, a system-wide system level? Not sure what you're asking me. Do, Across the court system, is it not important to understand in terms of the generalities of how uh, bail is either uh, granted or not, rather than just simply within individual cases? I think we're looking at um, your decision on to refuse bail, some of the reasons there, and it may be, as Liam MacArthur said, that some of the information that would then be recorded are very uh, helpful for you know, the services that should therefore be kicking in. Now, they may or may not be available as we continue our line of, um, our line of questioning then, that, that, will, that will come out. But um, I, I think we we'll refer to your opening statement, um, uh, uh, not on political, I don't think this is political, mm -hmm. I think it's an interpretation yeah. of the legislation and perhaps the legislation could be clearer on this and give a very strong indication that these should be written down, that might be helpful. If, if a written record, 
I rather think that you'd be far better with a, a recording, to be frank about it, because a written record requires someone to take a note, and you might not get everything that was said in that. But I, I come back to the, the, the point that if, if um, w when a decision is made, it's made in open court, and there may be a, a court reporter there, there may be someone who writes that down, they may not. Sometimes there is. The clerk takes a note. I never read the minutes afterwards because they don't come to me for signing. So a minute is taken by the clerk and it goes into the court papers and that's, that, that doesn't come back to me. I only ever see the court papers again if there's an appeal taken. And if an appeal taken, then I, it is taken that I write a note on the reasons that I've already given in court anyway. For, so there's something else you wanted to ask? Yeah, for, forgive me, but, but, but again, I think you're, you're going back to record keeping, which I, I agree is absolutely important. Yeah. But that's actually a very different question um, as compared to statistical data that's available to us, which would be looking at how bail is granted across the court system at an aggregate level, which is a very different question. And we are being told that that data simply does not exist. So that's not a question about record keeping. That's about aggregate aggregation of that record keeping so it can be looked at across the system as a whole about how bail is being granted or otherwise and that doesn't seem to exist in some courts uh, it, it courts will operate slightly differently I, I can tell you that in my court i actually do every time i make an adverse decision on bail so every time i refuse bail i there and then write the note that would form the basis of an appeal. I think quite a lot of uh, courts do that, and it goes with the court papers. So, in many cases, there is actually a written record that's written by the sheriff. I, I just think you don't understand the difference between statistics and record. I, I, I think I, I'm, that's... I'm not a statistician. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I think that's a bit harsh to say the, the, the least and probably unwanted. Um, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Sheriff Ludo. Um, just going back to you, you mentioned you had a checklist of criteria for either granting bail or, or deciding on remand. I'm just wondering, um, I, I don't have that checklist in front of me, so I, I, I don't obviously know what it is, but um, do, do, does the fact that, um, thinking particularly of women offenders, um, say, for instance, a single mother, does the fact that there would be children involved in, in that offender's case influence your decision? All of these things are taken into account. Uh -huh. uh, and the answer to that is, uh, th th there's no point in me telling you about what I would do particularly, because that's only me and how I make a decision. But uh, everything that's said in court mm. before a decision is made is taken into account, one way or another. Mm. Uh, so far as children are concerned, as far as uh, females are concerned, I am um, of the firm belief that there exists a positive discrimination in favour of females and on the question of bail. Uh, children, of course, uh, if, if they are, they, it happens that uh, someone turns up in court, they might well be a candidate for bail being refused because they've repeatedly offended or they've, for whatever reason. And yes, we do get told there are two children here and they're outside the court. <coughs> and someone has to uh, take care of them. Mm -hmm. And yes, it does get taken into account. I think care would have to be given in relation to any particular group of uh, individuals or any particular category of individuals if it was the intention uh, of uh, Parliament to ring fence a particular group mm -hmm. and uh, give them special mm -hmm. uh, rights, a get-out-of-jail-free card. Mm -hmm. Because it, it will be it's just used. That we, we know that there's a high number of, of women offenders uh, in, who are remanded, and about 75% of them don't go on to be charged. So, you know, it, I hear what you're saying, but there seems to be a wee bit of an imbalance somewhere in that line. They, well, they are charged, so it's not a question of going on to be charged, because they're charged, if they come into court, they've been charged. Yeah, well, so yeah, the but they, they don't go uh, on to. Uh, oh, yes, no, I, I, don't mean to be, I, I don't mean to pick up on that. Uh -huh. But uh, the. the uh, Quite often, it's the case that uh, you know, we don't have control over what the Crown does, and neither should we. And so, when, when a case is, when the Crown uh, decides to charge an individual 
then we are simply presented with the individual who has been charged. We do not know uh, anything more about the circumstances or whether the case is ever going to prove. And there are occasions when, the, on the face of it, you have an individual who looks as though they, they, they either have to, you know, the, the bail has to be refused. But when it gets to a trial, something goes wrong. And something over which we don't have control, and neither should we have control. I don't have control over whether um, the Crown leads the right uh, ev evidence, the right witnesses, makes a good job of uh, leading the evidence, whether the defence is superb at uh, defending the case. Uh, these are matters that are out with the control of the court. So I, I can't, uh, you may well have statistics, and it may well be the problem with statistics that they don't tell the story. Statistics might well say that, I, I think you've said, did you say 70%? I'm 75%. Not sure yeah. All right. So it may well be that there's a statistic, I don't know, that says that out of women who are remanded, and they're a very small number compared to the whole uh, amount of people who come through our courts, but there may well be a statistic that says out of that number, a, a, a high proportion don't end up being convicted. Mm. And it would be, I think, um, a distortion mm. of, and not an intentional distortion, but distortion of the analysis of that data, where you to look at that and say, that means the, the courts are being hard on women when they come before them and the question of liberty arises. You might have to analyse the data, if that's what you're inclined to do, and look elsewhere at why it is a conviction didn't follow. And you may find some really interesting information mm -hmm. about how that happens. Yeah, I mean, we, I'm, enc I'm encouraged if you say that at least children are taken into account when you're making your decision. Of course they um, are. I mean, that's okay. Can I just ask you one other, um, one other uh, question? Um, Ten years ago, the Scottish Prisons Commission uh, produced a report, and in it, it said sometimes people are remanded in custody because that's the only safe thing to do, but often remands are the, lack, are the result of a lack of information or lack of services in the community to support people on bail. I'm just wondering, in, in ten years, in your experience, if things have improved in that regard? There, there isn't uniformity, first of all, throughout the whole of uh, Scotland. You, you realise that. Yeah. And so what might be available in one place isn't available in another place. Some courts have um, supervised bail available. And supervised bail, if, if it's available, then it can be used as an option to try and avoid. I mean, the, David Strang is of the, the view that we are all a bunch of uh, uh, zealots, I think, who want to remand people. And in my experience, the, the, the truth couldn't further away from that. If someone can be uh, left at liberty, then I think the courts pretty much want to leave them at liberty. But it's a really difficult balancing act. Mm. On the, the one uh, hand, with the, you know, one type of case, you're looking at the danger that's involved. We quite often, in, in uh, Edinburgh, and I'm not sure about other courts, we have uh, a group called the uh, uh, EDACs. And they, it's, it's a group to do with uh, domestic violence, which uh, you, I think you, you, clearly you're familiar with. And we will prov be provided with a report from them as well at the initiation stage of a domestic violence case. And so that, it feeds into the system another layer of information. And of course, there are other layers of possible disposal. But faced on the one hand with EDACs telling us that uh, there's a serious risk to this woman if this individual who's accused of something is at liberty. He's only accused, he's not been convicted at that time. There's a serious risk to her. If you look at the previous convictions, there are three previous convictions out of the last four that have a domestic aggravator attached to them. And so there's a history of domestic abuse and a number of uh, different uh, uh, disposals. And EDAC say that's only the tip of the iceberg. 
this woman needs some respite. Then, the, the choice is quite a stark one. On the one hand, if, that, if bail is refused as you interfere with the liberty of that individual, then for, a, for two weeks, because that's what it would take, or, or for a short period of time, it's got to be within 40 days, depends on whether it's at, uh, at uh, post-conviction or not. But for a, a fairly short period of time, he cannot uh, offend against this woman because he's not at liberty to do it. If you uh, decide, well, I'm going to admit him to bail, but as well as the standard conditions, which you all know about, we can, I can impose special conditions. So I can impose a special condition of bail that he doesn't contact her or attempt to contact her, he doesn't approach her or attempt to approach her, and he doesn't enter the house or the street or even the, the area. Now, that, on the one hand, provides a, a level of protection, but it only provides a level of protection if the individual will adhere to it. And if he won't adhere to it, then you can pile on as many other factors as you like. They won't work if he's inclined to breach uh, bail. And so you've already looked, but if you're going through this exercise, you look back at the record. And it, you look at the record and you see there are a number of breaches of the bail act. There are a number of bail aggravations in uh, previous convictions that this individual has had. And you can make an assessment on whether the risk is too high for that individual. Okay, that's, thank that's, you. That's what thank we you. do. Yeah. Um, we're, we're kind of over time as, as it is, so <laughs> we'll, we'll try and be brief with our questions and with the replies. Um, Maurice Curry. Thank you, Marina. Good morning, Sheriff. Good morning. Um, Professor Hutton of uh, University of South Clyde suggests that remand is most commonly used where a person has a significant history of failure mm. to comply with court orders and indeed probably often combined with significant criminal record, which you just referred to in the case of the uh, of the mass abuse. Um, and also, they're likely to have, those such people are likely to have chaotic lives that are characterised as a combination of alcohol and drugs abuse, um, unemployment and mental health problems. Yeah. And also, in effect, the court is being asked to apply a criminal justice uh, solution to a problem which really relates to public health or welfare issues. Do you feel that's correct? I'd like to comment on it. In other words, doing the job of the social services. In a limited way, yes, I would agree to some extent with that. It, it, it doesn't fall within... It, 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 it's not something that I'm entitled to take a view on, in a way, because it's, um, it's ask, it, I would be addressing a political question. I would be addressing a question of whether there's something socially wrong with the setup, And that's entirely a matter for yourselves. Mm -hmm. But, yes, there are uh, circumstances... I, I think a better example is more uh, would be more mental health uh, individuals right. who come before us right. when it's absolutely clear that there might be another way of dealing with them. Yeah, can can I follow on with that, um, Queen? I mean, it, basically, it, it is related, obviously, to remand. And what do you see as the main drivers behind the current level of use of demand of remand? Offending. Yeah, offending. Yeah. What, 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 uh, where would you use remand in relation to that sort of situation? Well, I don't use remand. I, I, I decide whether I'm going to admit or refuse bail. Right. But so uh, remand isn't something that we use as a tool. It doesn't exist it, it, as being used as a tool. Although, uh, perhaps it's somewhat anecdotally, we very regularly, uh, so certainly fairly regularly, have circumstances where an individual has been uh, refused. Uh, that, this is post-conviction, uh, right. refuse bail, and you defer for two weeks for reports, and you remand them because you think it's too serious. Quite often, as it So you do out, use remand? Uh, no, no. Uh, you, you would, in, in those circumstances, you've refused bail because, A, you wouldn't, ask, normally, you wouldn't normally ask for a, a report unless you're considering mm -hmm. custody, because there'd be no point. You can oppose a, a fine there and then. You can... Uh, place them on a curfew there and then on a deferred sentence and you can order up to 100 hours of unpaid work from the community there and then. Mm. So it's, it's generally speaking only if you're considering a, a custodial sentence or 
if these social uh, circumstances are so uh, convoluted that you really need a bit more information. If it's the latter, it's very unlikely that someone would be refused bail. If it's the former, then they may be refused bail because they pose such a risk. But if there's a danger to community safety, right, yes. and you, you're, you're, you're concerned about that, would you not err in favour of remanding them in case it didn't appear, appear at it court wouldn't, or it wouldn't be, could an be error. a danger to the public? It wouldn't be an error in favour of remanding. It would be entirely appropriate in those circumstances if, if, to refuse bail. And you have to measure it. It's measured against... If I go back to the example... Yeah, but refuse bail presumably means that they're going to be remanded, isn't it? Yes, yeah, but, exactly. but it's not... There are that you look at and being a, 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 a danger to the public would be one of the, the things you would have taken into account. I, it goes back to where I began. Yeah. It's 23C yeah, and applying the criteria that uh -huh. Parliament has provided, mm -hmm. yeah. which is, <clears throat> is what we do. OK, full okay, thank supplementary. You. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Sheriff Waddle. You, you mentioned in your earlier answer about um, me mental health problems. I won't ask you... Uh, what you think the solutions to that would be? I think that would probably verge on a, on a political uh, issue. But can I just ask uh, uh, briefly then, if you and your colleagues are seeing an increase in people with mental health problems through the court system? I can't speak for my colleagues because I don't know the answer to that. Um, th there's more than I think there ought to be. Well, I can't really say whether it's increased over any particular period of time. OK. Thank you. Uh, uh, OK. Thank you, Manny. I, yeah, I just have a, a couple of brief questions, given it based on answers that we've heard before as well. And one is about the appeals process. We touched on that earlier. Yes. I was just wondering if you had any sort of rough idea or, uh, of the number of appeals that go through and how many of those are successful? I'm afraid I don't. Although that, that can't be difficult to get hold of. OK, that's fine. That was just a question but that struck I, I me, but I completely answer. understand if, yeah, if you wouldn't have that information uh, to hand. Another question I have is about young offenders in particular, because I think we've heard about uh, female offenders and how there tends to be a higher proportion of women uh, held on remand. And just really in terms of, of young people as well, I suppose, I mean, again, I'd ideally be looking for figures again I understand if, if you don't have that information to hand either but just really in terms of what happens to young people when they are held on remand is consideration given as to where they are held um, for example I asked that question because I visited Rossi Young People's uh, Trust just in uh, Montrose yesterday and um, I heard of examples of uh, where young people were held on remand in the likes of Pomont Prison when a residential secure facility might be more appropriate, mm -hmm. where they would get more support. Um, and just really to get your, your thoughts on that and what is taken into consideration when we're looking at young people in particular. It, it's, it's not within my uh, control to, send, to, to say what, what they go to one institution or another. That's a decision mm -hmm. that's made elsewhere. Uh, I entirely accept the proposition that there's very little, I, th I think nothing can be done with individuals when they've been remanded for another court hearing, because it's either two weeks or it's less than 40 days, depending on which stage you're at. And even, I, I, I know that you're considering um, short sentences being 12 months rather than three months, but the reality is that a short sentence of 12 months although the public may think that's what it is, isn't. It's a sentence of around three. And nothing can be done in that time either, because you know, with, with, with a, an automatic entitlement to half, you're down to six months. With uh, prisons having, having the ability, which they exercise, to release someone after about three months, the reality is that n there's nothing practical, as far as I can understand it, can be done in relation to reforming someone or putting them on a regime. It's different if it's a solemn matter and it's years that they've been in prison for. Thank you. Um, I think I do just have serious concern, obviously, that we do more harm than good to our young people when we hold them on remand. And let's like, say if, if they then either don't go on to be convicted or they're given a, a shorter yeah. sentence as a result of that. And I suppose it really follows on from uh, my colleagues' questions uh, beforehand. But um, I'd also just like to ask, it's been suggested in our evidence that more use could be made of stand-down reports where criminal, uh, criminal justice social input is needed. Uh, is that something that you would agree with? 
it depends on the court. I do use stand-down reports sometimes, and that's partly I tied that with a request for um, supervised bail, which, which is uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in some ways linked. But yes, if I, I come back to the same thing. Effectively, we are, you know, if, if we are applying the Act, and we do, and we apply the statute, we are looking to admit people to bail, unless the circumstances are such that you can't reasonably do that in the public interest. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And um, moving on now to John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, yeah, Sheriff. Good morning. Uh, I'll be very brief because you've already touched on this. And it's the question about the consistency of support services of, across Scotland. Just a couple of brief points on that, please. Uh, has your association ever commented on that? And the availability of, for instance, bail supervision, I mean, the more ranges that you have at your disposal, the better. But is that a significant impact on the, the, the consequences of being remanded if bail supervision is not available? I can't comment, first of all, on what support there is in each court because I, ha I don't have that information available. So far as being a significant influence is concerned, I I'm not sure it's very significant because if, 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 if I go back to the example of the individual being told by EDX that the, 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 there's a very high risk of uh, further offending against the, you know, a, 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 a domestic case, no matter how high the myriad of provisions are that you put in place, it's not going to stop the determined offender. And so that's really the judgment call you have to make. So it's pretty rare coming back uh, to find that if only there had been an opportunity to you know, have this provision or that provision, because we do have the abil ability to make... Uh, special conditions of bail if we believe that they'll be adhered to. If I may please come back to your yes. checklist, then, yes. Sheriff, that you talk about. What would the availability of bail supervision offset on that list in any way, or, or, or is it just another factor that the presiding uh, judge would consider? Well, it's usually for young people, uh, younger people. And what it does is it, keep, it, it provides a level of supervision that you wouldn't have. If you admit someone to bail, then nothing happens until they come back unless you know, they've offended or something like that in the meantime. But with bail supervision, you've got someone from the social work department who will, I think it's the social work department, who will be keeping an eye on them. And it's usually a three-page document or four-page document that sets out precisely what they'll be expected to do, whether to check in on a daily basis, make sure they go to interviews, make sure they, they go to have the, uh, social, uh, the, the social inquiry report prepared and so on. So it provides that, 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 that there's, um, it's, a, it's a level of supervision that you wouldn't otherwise have had. It might influence, I suppose, to some extent, the question of whether you expect that the individual will be back the next time round and they will be back with the report that means you can dispose of the case. OK, thank you very much. OK, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, Sheriff Lodo. Just following on from John Finney's questioning, in terms of the evidence we've received around issues in organisations beyond the criminal justice system, yes, so not yes. the, the, the bail supervision, but be other services and, and organisations that support the ongoing rehabilitation or, or, or support, how, how important is it that more general services are in place, particularly to support vulnerable people. Uh, do you agree that that's an important piece of your decision making, and uh, either anecdotally or generally in your experience? Uh, I just, in terms of the, the, what you said earlier about considering all the circumstances um, and then making a decision in the public interest. It's more a disposal question, ultimately, than it is related to the question of whether one's admitted to bail or not. Because you have, it, once it comes to disposal, then you take into account all the personal and social circumstances. The, 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 the bail question is, to a, minute, uh, to a great extent, a cruder uh, consideration than that. And it is to do with public safety. To, you know, the, the, as it turns out, I, I, personally, I think the provisions in the Act are particularly good. 
because it gives us a very clear steer on what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to apply it. Now, of course, it's open to Parliament to change what's in 23C and you know, put in some other provisions, take out some of the provisions. And as I said earlier, that those will, of course, have consequences, but that's the intention. You know, if you change the provisions in order to adjust the number of people that might be placed or that they might have bail refused or, or granted, then the consequences of that are, are, are for you, not for me. And I appreciate this, this supplementary may be slightly political, so if it is, you know, I'll understand. But it, in order to, to allow more um, bail uh, disposals to be, to be made, uh, is an investment and bolstering of general services required as well as the, within the criminal justice system in order to provide that support to vulnerable people? Or is it a, a policy decision rather than a judicial one? <laughs> it's it's not, not really something I can comfortably uh, comment on. appreciate that. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I don't think really I, I, I would be entitled because it's, it, it depends on what you want to happen. Understood. Thank you. If I could put it another way, you're yes. here not just in the capacity of Sheriff of Edinburgh, Lothian and, and the Borders, but as the President uh -huh. of the Sheriff's Association. So are you aware of perhaps um, Apache, um, if you like, um, Apache uh, number of alternative or suites of alternatives in the various kind of districts looking geographically that you may have certain um, disposals um, available to you which might help you know decide whether remand is is um, the correct um, way to proceed or not other colleagues may not have the same ones is that problematic I don't really think it would make a great deal of difference if, if you go through the um, the provisions of section 23c and 23b because the, the the question is sharper than that in a way and if if you are persuaded to the view that an individual cannot be trusted to to, to be uh, at liberty because that individual uh, provides a, a danger to the public from reoffending or for, for, for whatever then it comes back to the, uh, the, the provisions that you may put in place to try to persuade them yeah. to adhere. But uh, I understand. And Daniel, you wanted just to, to yeah. say something? Well, well, thank you, convener. I, I, I recognise that some of my earlier comments were insufficiently well tempered, and uh, to that extent, I just want to put on the, on the record just a, 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 an apology if, if that was the case. So, uh, and thank you for letting me do that, convener. Well, that's completely unnecessary. But thank you very much for that. Okay, uh, and can I thank you very much for um, for being prepared to give evidence today. It's tremendously helpful to the committee to have someone that's actively on the bench and to, to get their, their view of it, which you've given us today. So thank you very much. We'll now suspend for a change of witnesses. My pleasure. I hope it's been of assistance.
I, we now move on to the second panel of witnesses, and it's my pleasure to welcome Leanne McQuillian, President of Edinburgh Bar Association, Gillian Maudsley, Policy Executive with the Law Society of Scotland, and Professor Neil Hutton, University of Strathclyde. And can I thank the Law Society and Professor Hutton for the written submission. As always, they are very, very helpful to the committee. And again, if I could start with much the same question as in the previous panel, that the committee is aware that the possible reasons for remanding a person in custody include concerns that the person will, if released on bail, fail to appear in court, engage in criminal activity, or interfere with witnesses. And can I ask the panel, therefore, to what extent do these other particular grounds feature in decisions to remand people? These and other. <laughs> Professor Hatton. Um, okay, so I, I'll refer to my written submission and the, the very small pilot study. I think it's, to call it research is probably a bit strong, but it's a pilot study that was done in, in, in a court. And um, th those indeed are the reasons, along with the seriousness of the offence and, and previous convictions, which are regularly used by the courts to, uh, by the court to justify decisions uh, about uh, failing to uh, admit bail. Okay. Would you like to elaborate a little bit more on the pilots, um, for the record? <laughs> so, um, very frequently, judges give more than one reason. I think one of the difficulties is we're trying, if you're trying to think about why is, is uh, a bail not uh, granted, is it because of this or is it because of that? It's very frequently because of a number of uh, uh, reasons at the same time. Uh, these are very often people who have significant records, who have failed to comply with court orders before, uh, who, have, pre um, who uh, uh, have no fixed abode, who've breached bail and so on and so on and have chaotic lifestyles. Not all of them, but a significant number of them have these multiple things. So it's difficult to know exactly why, you know, is there one reason or another reason? It's, it tends to be multiple reasons. Okay. Um, Ms. Modley? Yes. Um, I would just uh, seek to endorse what Professor Hutton has said. Um, he says in his submission it's difficult to measure the effect of any particular reason, and certainly from my practical experience, it tends to be a multitude of factors that perhaps influences one way or, or other. And in that extent, again, I would refer to our submission when we talked about um, probably the majority of the cases it's clear cut one way or other, but the ones, of course, which you're directly concerned with are the ones that lie in the middle, where the uh, balance could go either way. And I would again echo the police's um, submission that obviously it's a breach of Article 5, but that it should only be done where it's proportionate, necessary, legitimate, and subject to appro appropriate scrutiny. And therefore, that reasoning should be the ones in which the various factors that Professor Hutton has referred to should be being able to be ascribed to. Thank you. And Ms. McCullough? Um, yes, I certainly would agree that it's usually a combination of factors. Um, and I would agree with what um, Ms Maudsley says in relation to most cases are quite clear cut. You can, ten you can generally tell if someone's definitely going to be remanded in custody um, and you can usually tell if they're going to be admitted to bail. There are some in the middle which are, are not quite so clear cut. But from my experience, I'd say that the main factors uh, which would result in a remand would be someone's record uh, previous convictions, and that can include failures to appear and breaches of special conditions of bail previously, but also uh, often people appear uh, charged with a, a criminal offence and they can be on multiple bail orders already, mm -hmm. up to sometimes people are still being released on bail on four, five, six bail orders, um, and those people get to the point where no matter what they're personal circumstances, they just couldn't possibly be released on bail again. Okay, thank you very much for that. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, you may have heard my question earlier. I have been concerned throughout these sessions about the lack of robust data uh, on why remand is being, or why bail is being refused, uh, if I can put it that way. Uh, do you have any view on the lack of data uh, and what could be done? Um, I suspect that, as the Sheriff uh, said to you earlier, that, that a note is made in the record and there is probably data there somewhere, but nobody actually collects it and analyses it. Uh, uh, and whether 
So we don't know whether there's, the data is accurate, we don't know what the data is, but it, there may well be some information there. Um, so this little study was an attempt to try to deal with that issue uh, of, of, of the lack of data and, and to try to find out what are the reasons. Um, a larger study, I suspect, would find that in, 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 in a much larger numbers. I think that's probably a, a fairly accurate reflection of what's going on. Can I ask you about that? Because I, I found your paper, I found all the papers extremely useful. I found that fascinating, the, uh, the pilot study. Because what it suggests to me, on a very small level, is that the sheriffs are handing down clearly sensible and supportable decisions guided by Section 23. Uh, now, if the committee seeks to reduce the incidence of remand, the sheriff was quite clear it's a decision for, for Parliament on Section 23, uh, then presumably the committee needs to un very, understand very clearly what these drivers are. And if I'm right on that, somebody should be collating that data and doing the study. Do you have any view on uh, who that should be, uh, which agency that should be, and why that hasn't been done? Um, as to why, it's always difficult to say why something hasn't happened. <laughs> um, so I, I, I couldn't really say why that hasn't happened. Who should be responsible for doing it? I mean, the data will be collected by the Scottish Court Service, as I suppose. So they have it. Whether they they would not be required to analyse it by any other body. They would not be required to produce that. Do, do you, just uh, sticking with the study and perhaps uh, if others have a view, do you know how much information, where, where a reason for refusing bail or reason for remand, for remanding okay. someone uh, has happened and is recorded, do you know how much information is recorded in that regard? Is there any common practice, or can it just vary across the, the board? I think uh, it varies. Um, if bail is refused, um, as the Sheriff has indicated that reasons are given in open court, these can generally be quite brief, just, well, because of your record, or because of this, or because of that. If there's no appeal uh, to the, the Sheriff Appeal Court, then there, there isn't anything further done in relation to those reasons. Um, if there is appeal to, an appeal to the Sheriff Appeal Court, which in my experience is quite often if someone's remanded, um, then the Sheriff will compile a report. Uh, I appear in the Sheriff Appeal Court quite, quite regularly and I see reports from all over Scotland as well as Edinburgh. Some are a sort of format where they'll tick a box, um, just say risk of reoffending, schedule of previous convictions. Others can sometimes um, give an awful lot of information, go into two or three pages, um, perhaps when they, they feel that the, the reason to remand might need to be justified because that person might have difficulties. Um, but I think part of the difficulty as well in, in having re reliable statistics and reliable information is that there isn't the same, if bail is granted, there isn't the same, unless the Crown appeal it, which is very rare, then a sheriff doesn't have to do a report saying, here's why I granted bail. It's just, right, that's fine, bail on you go. Um, so it really focuses on the people where, who are remanded. Um, and I would expect that because a lot of those cases are appealed to the Sheriff Appeal Court, it might not be too difficult to get some more information about reasoning uh, behind remands. Because I've certainly seen countless reports by sheriffs who are just justifying, and most of them have got enough information in them that you can clearly, so you can clearly see their reason. Do you take a view then, for us as a committee going forward, on uh, do any of you feel that it would be a good idea if sheriffs were uh, more closely guided as to that they would have to give reasons and what the extent of those reasons should be? In the same way as we heard from the sheriffs this morning, look, I have section 23, I go through that, I, I'm very clear about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Do you think we should be considering asking for uh, that to be the, the reasons to be very clearly set out and why they've come to their decision? Um, I was going to say that I think the point <laughs> is I think the reasons are quite well articulated in open court. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, I agree with what uh, Ms. McQuillan says that it will be stated by the sheriff or the judge because you must remember the extent across the judiciary. So you've got JPs making decisions in this as well, which is a factor, but it will be well articulated. 
I think, in open court, because the defense, um, just for fairness to the accused, if you're going to be remanded. Um, and I think one of the problems is the correlation of statistics. You know, so everybody has the information that you want, but it's not put from the person that's been, you know, remanded to the prison, that you're not getting the... So I think there's a tie-up with the criminal justice, not so much that it wouldn't be articulated, but perhaps not recorded in a fashion that you can then see this person's journey through the court. I was just going to mention one other thing, if I may. In my preparation for this, I found um, that in England and Wales, um, there was a European um, Commission, uh, part of 10 countries, on the practice of pre-trial detention in England and Wales, a research report that was reported from the University of the West of England in Bristol by Ed Capes. Now, I will bring this to your clerk's attention, but that has got a lot of the research, Mr Kerr, that I think you, the kind of um, if you like, the methodologies of going to court, gathering. And I think that document could be a useful document because it translates across. It's obviously divided. So I had discovered this last night and was going to suggest that, that if you, the committee weren't already aware of it, that might be a useful document for you to be aware of because they have looked at a number of these provisions in, as part of European Commission roadmap. And that, I think, might give you some of the methodologies that you're talking about. I think that would be very useful if you would. Thank you. Can I just... Yeah, of course. Uh, the, um, if, asking judges to record the reasons for giving bail and collecting that data kind of suggests that uh, there's a feeling that the judges are not giving, you know, not, not making proper decisions, that somehow they're, they're making decisions without justifying them properly. This little research would suggest that judges can find plenty of reasons mm -hmm. under the Act for remanding people in custody. They don't do it lightly, I don't think. I don't think, I don't think they, I think they try to keep people out of court as, as, as best they can, but when these multiple reasons come up, there'd be no problem in judges finding many reasons to justify uh, not granting bail. So can, I'm not sure what you would gain by having that, those reasons can more, I, given more publicly. Yeah, can I just say that the, the committee has no preconceived um, <laughs> opinions on this. We are aware that the amount of remand is going up and increasing, so we're trying to delve into why that should be, and uh, we're certainly not making any um, uh, any decisions about you know the the or any judgment on the judicial decision. Is to try and tease out what's available to the judge on the day. Yeah. Would it help to try and reduce the number of prisoners uh, currently remanded in custody? I'm not sure it would. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, that's why. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> um, Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, in the previous session, I was asking Sheriff Little about decisions being taken with regard to women offenders. And... Um, I was encouraged to hear that you know children and family are taken into account when it comes to remand, but notwithstanding the number of women being taken into remand is, is increasing. Um, it's probably an all-time high. And I know, I think, um, Ms Maudsley, you say in your submission that it's not known why. Um, and I, I wondered if you had any kind of uh, ideas beyond, beyond that, because it's, 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 it's something that's obviously quite a serious issue. And can I ask if you think too many women are being held uh, in remand? Well, I think if you look at the straightforward statistics, I mean, usually um, the number of women, if you like, convicted is less than men. So if you equate that back to the number, you know, proportionality tells me that there are you know, from the numbers that have been quoted, that clearly a number of women are being remanded. I suspect when you break it down, there will be multiple reasons why they're being remanded. And perhaps um, what Mr. Kerr has talked about, the breakdown of the reasons, would help to perhaps shed some greater light as to the reasons. I myself don't know. I mean, I, I, I have gone to Quantum Vale. I have met people on, on remand. I'm not sure why that should be the case, but I can certainly see where women have, um, you know, mothering duties and, and it's very clear from families outside and all their work, mm -hmm. just the dramatic effect on the family. I think the only thing I would say against that is what victim support. Obviously, you have to look at the other side of the equation and decisions shouldn't really directly be being influenced by, if you like, the sex, but clearly there are other family circumstances. I think possibly Ms McQuillan and I will have more direct, um, you know, recent experience in myself and may be able to assist. I 
don't know why the numbers of women uh, being remanded is increasing because certainly whilst, as Sheriff Little said, it's being a, a, a mother with a children, um, it's not a get out of jail free card. But I, in my experience, I don't see females being remanded uh, regularly when I think it's unfair. Um, some, obviously females offend a lot, a lot less than males, but and certainly my female clients, they tend to have an awful lot of issues. They tend to have mental health problems. Um, if, to be honest, if, a, if one of my clients is still has the care of her children, she's unlikely to be in a position where she's going to be remanded because most of my clients, um, when they get to the point where they might be remanded in custody, they've lost the care of their children uh, quite some time ago due to uh, chaotic lifestyles, offending, bad relationships, drug habits, mental health problems. And it, the women who offend regularly do tend to have a lot more of these is issues than, than men, I would say. Um, but I, I don't know why there are more mm. women being remanded. D does that not suggest that, um, you know, from, from the checklist, I mean, are these women a danger to the public? Does that not suggest that more support is needed for them? Well, I think... Uh, there is, a, there is a lot of support in Edinburgh. I don't know about other places, um, and there are some really good projects in Edinburgh, like the Willow Project and things like that, that, that are really good uh, for, for vulnerable women. Um, whether they're a danger to the public, I don't know, but that's, that's only one factor. And as I said earlier, um, thinking of one particular client of mine who has been released on bail multiple times because she has so many uh, issues in her life, she constantly reoffends. She gets given opportunity after opportunity, and it's not high-level offending. It's nuisance offending. It's mm -hmm. disorderly behaviour. But I suppose if that's your neighbour, or if if you live in a street where someone's it's alcohol issues, and uh, she might get drunk and cause a, 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 a disturbance, and there's only so long. Although she's not a, she's not a danger to the public, but it's a it can be a real nuisance and real disruption for, for the public. But the fact that she's repeating that behaviour suggests that remand isn't helping. Well, she actually very rarely ends up getting remanded. So she's, um, she's, she gets bail. She gets bail. Right. Yes, okay. um, she does. She get. I find generally sheriffs are, are very sympathetic to people uh, with with problems. Um, and things like supervised bail, I don't think she's ever had been on supervised bail, but she's got lots of, she's lucky, she's got lots of people, lots of support. Um, but even then, there's sometimes you can have all the support in the world, but it's just not, it just doesn't, doesn't work. Thank you. Can I ask you mentioned the Willow uh, Centre. Would somebody on remand be, or as an alternative remand, be able to access the Willow Centre, or would it be a, an alternative to imprisonment? It's a it's a voluntary service that a lot of women access just because they want help. But often, um, when a sheriff goes to or a sentencer uh, input goes to deal with the, the case finally, um, it may be a condition of a community payback order that the, the lady continues to engage with the Willow Project. They're very good at providing reports, or the sheriff could defer sentence to, um, and one of the conditions of a deferral of sentence is to engage with the Willow Project. It's not a particularly a, 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 an alternative to remand, but we would t in making a bail application, we would tell the sheriff this lady is, is um, goes to the Willow Project. Sometimes someone comes along. Um, occasionally, we might have a report from them from a, a recent case that we can give the sheriff. So it is relevant to the question of bail, but it's not a, a bail condition kind of thing. So there is some latitude within the conditions to start to to sort of get into a bit more detail of of what conditions could be put in place, what kind of, like go to the Willow Centre or, or attend something else, and depending on the services. Would the, is, that, is a criminal uh, justice social work report always available? Uh, no, the, the criminal justice, sometimes we will have a recent, just because the person's had a recent case, we will have a criminal justice social work report which is maybe a month old or something and we might, if we know the person's going to be appearing from custody, we might make arrangements to have a copy of that so that we, we, we are fully aware of, of the, the woman's situation um, and we can sometimes give that to the sheriff as well but this is really just a, a, 
an extra thing that we can do to try and make sure that the sheriffs are fu fully aware of all the circumstances. And those reports will make reference to any agencies that the, the woman or the, the, the man, as, uh, as the case may be, uh, is, is seeing and how they're getting on with that. Um, I, I make reference to, to the uh, criminal work, uh, social work, because again in the written submission from the Senators of the College of Justice, they say that they, they are in attendance in the Sheriff Court and uh, may be available should the High Court request their attendance, uh, and that's the same position in Glasgow, Livingston and Aberdeen. But the situation makes access to information and options in respect of bail or remand more difficult to achieve. Certainly, um, when I first started appearing in Edinburgh, uh, there was always a social worker present in court, present in the custody court throughout. Um, and if a criminal justice social work report was, was called for, they would make notes, they'd be involved in that. They wouldn't particularly get involved in, in the decision of the sheriff, but no. sometimes they might have information. Um, they changed that quite recently. Um, I actually, before coming to give evidence, spoke to the, one of the social workers who's based in, in, in Edinburgh Sheriff Court. The reason for that is they felt that their time could be better spent doing other things, um, although they are available and, and if, they're at, if, at, if asked, they can come down to court, but, but they're, not, they're very rarely there now. They but are in the, the building. The report would be available, most certainly, and that would con presumably contain information that might help the sheriff look at the conditions that were appropriate. Well, the report, the the a criminal justice social work report will be will only be called for once the person has been convicted. Ah. So there won't be yeah. an actual report unless, uh, as I said, unless we happen to have one. The solicit yeah. defence solicitor happens to have one from a recent case, which could be of assistance. But that's not an official. Um, a, we forward um, and the issue of stand down reports is again it's post conviction so pre -con pre conviction there really isn't very much information available from the social work department unless the defence solicitor happens to be aware of it okay and Morris that question uh, if I may agree uh, Mr. Quillen would it not be sensible that that information was available to, to, to assist the, the sheriff in his deliberations to, be a, to get a more accurate view of that person because clearly we're hearing that mental health problems, for example, are, are featuring more greatly and probably not being understood. I suppose it's a logistical and practical issue in, in Edinburgh, although the custodies have gone down recently because of the new Act, but prior to January there can be 30 plus custodies a day um, some, not all of these will obviously be have a problem with bail. A lot of them will be will, will get, bail won't be opposed, um, but to have that information available for everybody, um, I think would be a really difficult. Um, I think a lot of the time the sheriff depends on the defence solicitor to advise them of the, the situation, um, but our information can be out can be outdated as well, and it's often difficult to get a clear picture from an accused who perhaps isn't in the best frame of mind when they're in the cells and they're being told that they might be getting remanded in custody. Um, one issue, uh, the, the Crown um, obviously have a decision whether to oppose bail or not, um, and I know that the Sheriff ultimately makes the decision, and it doesn't really, if the Crown don't oppose bail, the Sheriff can remand, but that very, very rarely happens. Very rarely. It's, 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 very, it's exceptional. So I, I would have thought that the, the Procurator Fiscal in Court is not the person who has made a decision as to whether to oppose bail in the case. The case is marked sometimes in a different city, in a central marking hub, or at, the, at best upstairs in an office, and the papers come down to court and the fiscal just right says, bail opposed, bail opposed. And so sometimes uh, defence agents try to speak to the Procurator Fiscal and say, look, this person has got these mental health problems, um, they've seen a psychiatrist, I've got this report, any chance you could change your mind and not oppose bail. And uh, years ago, the, fisc the Procurator Fiscal in court, I think, felt they had a discretion and would say, OK, that's fine, or they would speak to someone else. Now, uh, they feel, whether or not it's the case or not, I wouldn't like to say because I don't want work for Crown Office, but they feel that they have no discretion and they say, no, I'm opposing bail, and then you have to put the position to the Sheriff, and the Sheriff may or may not grant bail, but if, if the Crown 
felt they had a little bit more discretion um, because we can give them information just while the court's adjourned. We can have a chat and say, this person's really, I know they've got a bad record, but they're going through this, it's, they've got children. And they can change their mind, but I think they, they, the perception is they don't want to get into trouble if they do change their mind. Thank you. And um, Daniel. Uh, yes, I mean, I think I'd just like to sort of principally um, address this question to, to Neil Hutton. I mean, I think the reason that we are uh, you know, looking at this is in terms of the, the aggregate picture where uh, on a, uh, uh, in terms of the, the, the average daily prison population, 18% of the prison population, male prison population are remand prisoners as opposed to convicted prisoners, and likewise at 24%, certainly in uh, figures from 1617. But I think that, that, that coupled with the, the, the evidence from the Prison Reform Trust who say that the uh, proportion of prisoners on remand in Scotland is higher than England and Wales, I think the those things combined, I think, lead us to, to conclude that, that you know, are we doing things differently in Scotland, but also that, that, that that's a very high proportion given that a significant number of those prisoners won't be given custodial sentences or even found guilty. Uh, so is that reflection a, a correct one, just given what you were saying earlier about kind of if we had more data, it might not actually show us anything or, or, or point to, 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 to any areas where we might be able to reduce the levels of remand? Um, well, I mean, I was on the Sentencing Commission for Scotland, where, which we wrote a report on bail remand. When was that? 2006, a uh -huh. long time ago. Um, I don't think the situation has changed a great deal since then. Uh, uh, so, um, I, I'm, if you ask why, why are we lar greater than England and Wales, it's, if we are, it's not by much. Um, right. There are other <laughs> European countries who manage to make use of remand less frequently than we do. I'm not quite sure how they manage that, but I suspect you'll find that the, the countries where they make less use of remand and they will also make less use of imprisonment generally and they will have a greater proportion of their domestic products spent on welfare than they do on uh, um, uh, corrections or the, on, on the criminal justice system. Um, so for the Scandinavian countries, for example, so it's, it's not a, there's not a simple easy answer, we'll take this policy and transfer it over here. It's a, it's a matter of long histories of cultural change uh, that have been going on in, in, in different places. Um, so I mean, a, I mean, a rambling answer, but uh, 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 this is a very tricky problem that you're dealing with here. It's been around for a very long time, uh, and, and I, I, the, the, the legislation, the way it's set out, gives judges lots of reasons why they should not grant bail. Uh, and as the sheriff said to you before, if you wanted to change that, then it, it's for you to, to look at the, those reasons and see are there any of those reasons in particular which you would like to downgrade and say these are maybe less important th than we used to think they were. So, so two follow-on questions from that. I mean, you know, given the aggregate data and the comparative data, I mean, do you think we are, you, you're, it, it's correct to, 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 to be examining whether or not we're, we're uh, overusing um, uh, remand? Um, and uh, I'll just put that question. Well, I, I suspect, um, you know, the, the current government are, are, are trying to reduce the use of short prison sentences, and the two things are, of course, very closely related, because the, the, very much the same people who are remanded in custody are a similar group of people who are getting short prison sentences, and we use short prison sentences in Scotland disproportionately more frequently than other countries. Uh, so it's, it's this population of people who... Um, when I interviewed... Um, Sheriffs for the uh, when there was an evaluation of the community payback order when it was first introduced, and I managed to get a few questions in there to ask sheriffs what did they mean by prison being a last resort, and it was only a couple of questions, and it was 24 sheriffs I interviewed. So I, again, it's a small study, but there were kind of two groups of of, 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 of offenders: one which I called willful non-compliers, and the other feckless non-compliers. So the feckless non-compliers are people who simply cannot manage to comply with orders for one reason or another. The kind of people, that, 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 the person that Leanne was talking about, for whatever reasons their lives are so chaotic, they just simply cannot comply with the orders of, of the court, whether it's a community payback order or a bail order or license or whatever, they just keep reoffending, breaking bail and so on. And it's difficult, giving them um, a, 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 an order with more conditions 
isn't going to help because they just can't um, seem to comply with them. The others are willful, people who just say, I'm not doing it, I'm not going to turn up, willful non-compliers. And ultimately, the court then has to say, well, this is a court of law, it's not a welfare institution. There has to be uh, an unavoidable consequence at some point, and so prison is the unavoidable consequence that happens for them. And those are not necessarily always two distinct groups. Mm -hmm. They may well overlap from, from time to time. Uh, so it's, 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 that's the complexity of the problem, and it's, I think, the same for short prison sentences as it is for uh, the decisions about remand. It's what we do with people who will not comply with orders. It's what can the court do? Yeah. So, sorry, Julian Maudsley, were, were you wanting to come in? No, no, no. no, no. no. Okay. Can, can I just ask one final question? I mean, I think my concern in the, the last evidence session was uh, around kind of the, the, the consistency and uh, of record keeping and the how uh, its ability to be interrogated, uh, which, and the reason I'm concerned about that is about whether or not these decisions are being made consistently or not. I mean, given your your work and the insight that you have into that, I mean, are you confident that these decisions around uh, the, 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 uh, the granting of bail or otherwise are being made consistently in the courts? I can't answer that because, answer. Uh, you know, there, there is no a, a benchmark against which one might compare uh, practice. Uh, so even if you had the data, we wouldn't have a benchmark against which to compare practice. What, what does consistency mean? What, what, consistency means our judges complying with the legislation accurately or something like that. And according to this little study, judges are using reasons which are legitimate, they're lawful. Uh, uh, and so I, I, it's difficult, very difficult to see whether they're being consistent or not. I mean, anecdotally, you can speak to people who know, who are more familiar with the day-to-day -day in the system, and they might have different an anecdotal answers. Uh, Liam McArthur, supplementary. Thanks very much, Computer. Good morning. Um, I, I'm interested in, in the responses that you were given, Professor Hutton, to, um, to Daniel Johnson. I suppose one of the things that's changed since 2006-07 is that um, crime levels have, have reduced, and, and therefore, I suppose, it's thrown into starker relief what's, what's happening in relation to remand. But obviously, we're, we're, we're being told that all the evidence um, uh, underpinning the argument uh, of extending the presumption against short prison sentences is the same sort of evidence that underlies the concerns around increase in remand, and that the, the, the process of reoffending is, is more likely on the, on the back of, of these short spells uh, in prison. I, on, the, on the basis of, of that, I mean, recognising what a naughty uh, problem it, it, it is to, to unravel. What what would you say is the a, a correct policy response to that? Because I, I, I mean, I, I think it, it's all very well saying there's quite chaotic lifestyles there, and it's it's not for the criminal justice system to um, to, 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 to try and unravel. And, and I think all of us accept that. But um, you may not be bound by the same strictures as, as as the sheriff previously in terms of what you can can comment on. But but. Where are the policy remedies in, in, in that, then? Um, well, uh, uh, it, this is a criminal justice issue that we're dealing mm -hmm. with. It's, it's not a, I mean, uh, in the sense that we're talking about decisions that are made by the courts. So, it's, uh, so could the court's decisions be different? Um, possibly uh, the courts could be more tolerant, more patient of people who don't comply with orders. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, how that's going to work is, is very difficult to, to, to see. Um, for example, talking to sheriffs, they would say, well, I'm very sympathetic. I know this person is very likely um, to not turn up for their supervision. Uh, that, that's, um, but if I give them a community payback order so they don't turn up for the supervision, so that means that somebody in, in the social work has got to go and find them, write a report about them, come back. Uh, it, it, I'm, if I give that person a community payback order, I'm just creating extra work for somebody else to do. Uh, so it would get the person, it would keep the person out of prison, it would get them out of court, but it would, is that in the public interest to have social workers chasing up people who I know are not going to comply with orders? Mm -hmm. Is that a good use of their time? But I suppose if the, if the evidence is suggesting those short stints in prison, whether on remand or, or, or whether um, under custodial sentence, um, as a heightened risk of, of reoffending, 
then in a sense the, the, the counter argument is, well, the alternative to this rather unsatisfactory situation is, is even more costly and, and, and um, negative in terms of public interest than, yes. than the alternative. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the other thing is we have very strict uh, guidelines for uh, uh, what happens if you breach an order. So there's, there's very little discretion left to community payback supervisors or social workers, uh, criminal justice social workers or third section organisations, if people don't comply with orders. In times past, we might have trusted their judgment and said, well, if somebody's not turned up, you know, they haven't got a really good reason for that, but actually they're, really, they're trying the best to try and comply with this order, but they, keep, they, they, they mess up, let's give them another chance. Well, it's harder to do that now. They tend to come back to court more frequently. So in our efforts to try and make community payback orders appear to be tough, senses which have a consequence for people, the, the, the downside of that is where people fail to comply and you, you apply those uh, conditions very strictly, they're back in court again. Mm. Okay. Barry? Mm. I'd, I'd just like to cover a couple of the other areas that I'd uh, raised with our previous witnesses and wondering if uh, any of you had any sort of information as to the success of appeals against uh, for those who are being held on remand. Um, by and large, it, when, the, when the High Court used to hear uh, bail appeals, um, and they, they, they wouldn't be granted routinely, but they, they would be granted. Um, the, the problem is you can't, you, you don't go into an appeal and say, that, that, and say to the judge, you, should, you know, this person should have got bail. You have to say that the original decision maker, maker was, was in error. So the judges have a wide range of discretion and whilst the, the judge sitting on the appeal may think, well, I would have given the person bail, you have to point to an error in the original decision maker's reasoning. So um, generally, I think sheriffs, when they do remand in custody, I think they justify it fairly well and it's difficult to point to an error. Um, occasionally, people will be released on appeal, but it's certainly not the norm. Um, the Crown occasionally appeal against against people being granted bail, and I find more and more uh, the Crown appeals are being upheld, so those people are being remanded in custody when the Sheriff actually granted bail, but that's just from my kind of day-to-day -day experience. So, um, But, yeah, I think that the, the Sheriffs are, are good at justifying why they remand people, because I, <coughs> I honestly don't think that Sheriffs remand people lightly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's really useful to get that information. It was also just in terms of, I mean, do any of you have any information as to how we compare with other countries in terms of the, the populations that we have on remand? I don't have numbers with me, um, but I suspect, uh, and from, from memory, we, we do remand more than, than many jurisdictions, many European jurisdictions, as we also use short prison sentences more than other European jurisdictions. Okay, thank you. Um, I, just following on from my colleague Rona Mackay's uh, questions that she raised earlier about uh, women who are being held on remand, I mean, one of my concerns is also about uh, the numbers of young people that we have on remand, and I don't know if if you know uh, if that is, uh, if we do have quite high numbers of young people who are held on remand, and um, as I was saying in the, the last session as well, it's I think I'm just concerned that we do more harm than good with, especially with young people, we hold them in remand and depending on where they are, where they are held on remand as well and the impact that that can have on their lives. I don't have information about that, but I share your concern. I think certainly um, Pullman is a bit of a shock for some of the, the, the young boys who go there. I think they, they go around Edinburgh and they cause trouble and then they go into Pullman and I think sometimes they do get the shock of their lives. Um, and that can sometimes be a good thing for, for certain uh, people who maybe just need a, a little bit of a fright, but it can also have them mixing with um, a lot of, cause, because it, it services a, a wide geographical area, there's people from all over uh, Central Belt in Pullman, um, they they've gone from you know a 16, 17 year old who think they're like an adult, and they go in with some of these people who are in seri some serious trouble, and I think think they do find it very much a culture shock, and some of them probably shouldn't be there. But having said that, 
there is a problem um, in various areas of Edinburgh with certain younger boys, particularly, who do uh, constantly reoffend. You can see some 17, 18 year olds who have already got more than one page of previous convictions, they're on bail. And I think the, the, the courts do take account of their age when making a decision to remand them, but there does become a point when they really don't have much choice. Mm. But I think that goes back to some of the issues that we were talking about earlier too. It's just the fact that, well, why are they carrying out that behaviour? What is it that's happening in their own lives that leads them to that point? And I do just think that by imprisoning them, because what would the average stay of remand be? Are we doing more harm than good with them there? And especially if they're put in the likes of Polmont rather than, say, a residential secure facility where they have uh, at least access to proper care and education mm -hmm. during the time that they're in there, where they can start to address some of the problems that have led the young people to that point in their lives. And most of them certainly do have... Um, it's very rare that a child from a, who doesn't have any problems in their background just goes on this massive crime spree. Most of them have got mm -hmm. multiple issues and they are only children. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that maybe the places they have in secure units are limited and they tend to use those for under-16s who can't go, go to Pullman. And there are still, unfortunately, some under-16-year-olds who do end up being remanded to secure units. Um, but, yeah, it certainly can cause more harm than good to, to and if they're on if it's a summary complaint they will only be there for a matter of weeks I would say that more it's more likely that a young person will be remanded if they appear on petition and then it's a lot longer of a remand period but because they are still presumed if it's post if it's if it's pre-conviction they're still presumed innocent so they're not really the educational opportunities that there may even be if you're in Pullman as a convicted prisoner mm -hmm. um, and I think some of them think it's all a great laugh for a while and then they they, they realize that a few years later they might say you know I've wasted so many years uh, just thinking I was it was great fun going to Pullman and I'm missing out on school and education so it sh I think um, it should be avoided at, at, if at all possible, but sometimes if someone's on multiple bail orders, there aren't very many alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. John Finn? Oh, sorry. The Sentencing Commission for Scotland are, are just started preparing a guideline on the sentencing of young offenders, which should um, outline a new policy for sentencing young offenders. I've forgotten we had a supplementary. Um, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Professor Hunton, just on <coughs> the point you made about uh, we remand more than some European jurisdictions, and I accept you weren't basing that on data in front of you, but mm. uh, two questions on that. Why do you think that's the case if our remand decision or refusal of bail uh, is an objective decision based on criteria in Section 23? Is it that our legislation is more prescriptive? Is it more uh, robust? Uh, and the second part of that question is, do you think that we remand more individuals or do we remand the same individual multiple times? Yeah, well, that, that could well be the case. The, your second point, it could well be the case that, that, that there's are multiple, the same individual being counted several times. Um, the first, I, I don't know why uh, remand is less. I, I, again, I suspect there are, there, are diff, there are probably different services and, and options available in other jurisdictions. Right. Okay. okay, thank you. John Finnealer. Um, thank you, Kimina. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, I, I mentioned to the, the Sheriff about um, bail supervision, and we very clearly outlined the position, the criteria that the Sheriff is required to to consider uh, in relation to bail. Uh, but we've heard from a number of witnesses about concerns about the consistency of the availability of services, particularly bail supervision. And I wonder, do you, do you share these concerns? And do you have a view <coughs> on whether this inconsistency ultimately affects decisions on bail and therefore remand? Certainly, I can only speak for Edinburgh where we do have bail supervision. Um, we used to have a sacral bail um, which was quite widely used. Um, I was always referring people to be assessed for sacral bail. Um, they could also, one service that they used to provide was a bail, sort of bail hostel sit situation because often someone is homeless um, or they're staying from between 
you know, ad addresses, just staying with friends. Um, and Sacro used to provide a service uh, that they, you could get a bail address through Sacro, um, but they don't do that anymore, I assume due to lack of funding or lack of services. So the, the one the, they have now a supervised bail scheme, which I think is still a little bit underused in Edinburgh. I think um, there's maybe a bit of lack of awareness uh, be because I've asked some of my, my colleagues uh, before coming here, um, when was the last time you refer referred someone for supervised bail? And I think maybe it could be used a bit more. Um, Defence solicitors can refer people, sheriffs can refer people, which happens rarely, and procurator fiscals can re refer people, which happens even more rarely. Um, the, the problem with that, and it can help some people, because one of the, the aims is to try and help people cooperate with turning up at court and turning up for reports, but one of the criteria is that you have to have a stable address. Um, and one of the main reasons, I think, for failing to comply with court orders and turning up and so on can be a, a chaotic not having a fixed address. Um, so that's a, a limitation. Also, I'm, I'm not sure it may, it, it might help some people get bail that wouldn't otherwise get bail, but, but there are cer certain people who, if they could be assessed as suitable for supervised bail, the sheriff is still not going to grant them bail because the, the negative points outweigh the fact that they're now suitable for supervised bail. But I do think that it's, they're certainly not at capacity in Edinburgh because I asked the social worker and they could take more referrals. And can I just ask on that point then, as, as a defence uh, solicitor, is that something that you would make, a submission that you would make to the sheriff prior to the decision being taken on granting or otherwise of bail? I think if, if there was somebody in custody who uh, the, the Crown were opposing bail in respect of and who I thought were particularly vulnerable, it might be a, a, a female or perhaps someone with mental health uh, problems, although they, one of their criteria is you have, they can't take someone who's got too serious mental health problems because they have to still be able to <coughs> comply. The supervision is quite onerous. It starts off, I think, three times a week. But I would go to the social work department and ask the social workers to, to assess the, the, the accused there and then, and if they are assessed for super, suitable for supervised bail, then when you applied for bail, uh, you would say to the sheriff, I have a supervised bail report, and they are assessed as suitable for that, and that would be a factor that the sheriff would take into account. Forgive me, I know the other panel members, would, but is that something that you would understand the Crown would do as well? Would they make a similar representation? They can they? do, but they, they, they don't. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, my, my experience was Glasgow, um, again, a big city with a very busy court, and the Crown just wouldn't have the time. I was a Procurator Fiscal Deputy, wouldn't have the time and the number of custodies to have detailed, kind of, um, if you like, referral. But what they would do um, would be, if somebody was in that category where there might be background, there used to be availability of social workers in the court and there were certainly a number of projects like 218 comes to mind in Glasgow. So certainly I think across Scotland there are different projects, there are different um, and I think the sheriffs, just as the sheriff alluded to, they will be aware of them in their area. More collectively as part of judicial education I am fully aware that a number of these initiatives are talked about and, and used in judicial training. I think what isn't available, and this is a personal opinion rather than professional, is that all the good practices across the country, all the initiatives, nobody's actually kind of looking at them all together and saying what's good here, what's good there, and trying to develop a model. Now, I think that's possibly a role for the community justice organisations and, you know, obviously is a big, and perhaps that's something, because I think the provisions are there, and I think there is evidence that supervised bail, and I referred to community courts in this background of alcohol and drug dependence, where people are going through the system, where sheriffs are developing relationships and being able to encourage and support. So I do think there is a huge, you know, there's a lot of very good work, but perhaps it's not always... <coughs> Um, being spread about, if that's at all helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't want to be... I mean, I think it's, uh, the, the, the research evidence suggests that bail supervision schemes can make a very modest difference to the use of Iran, but not a huge difference. And one of the reasons for that might be that judges uh, will 
give use supervised bail where they would use bail anyway and not use supervised bail instead of remand. And, that's, and it's, it's the same with introducing community penalties as alternative to imprisonment. And judges are very keen to use community penalties and use them in, in Scotland ex much more than they ever did before. But they still use prison to the, roughly the same extent as they always have done. So the, the, the community penalties have not replaced prison sentences. And that's the issue with supervised bail as well, I suspect. OK, many thanks. Okay, Fulton, supplementary. Uh, I'm kind of following on from that point. Hey, Liam McQuillan, you, you mentioned earlier that you know, you know when somebody's going to get remand eh, or not remand, and then there's a, a sort of grey area. Do you feel that bail supervision is just used in the grey area, or are you finding it's more and more used in, when somebody would, would have been more likely to get remand? Or, in con and conversely, eh, is, there, is there situations arising where people would get supervision? A bail supervision, where previously they may have just got normal bail, and I think that actually came up in a, a previous session as well. I think certainly in Edinburgh, and I, I, I practice mainly in Edinburgh, but I think bail supervision is definitely underused. So there aren't very many cases where some someone is there. There's not a case, situation where every day there's three or four people being assessed for supervised bail. It's it's not that much used that often. But I I. I think that there could possibly be a situation where because you, you, you see their bail is going to be opposed before you, the case calls, so I might think, right, I'm going to get this person assessed for supervised bail. Now, that person might have got bail anyway if I had explained to the sheriff their particular difficulties. So they, they might be getting supervised bail as a, an extra layer on, onto what they would have just got ordinary bail. I don't know if that's a bad thing um, because it will give the person a bit more support. But I don't think there would be very many people who, if there might be some people who if they're, they're, at, they're on the cusp they're, about, they're on the cusp of being remanded and the super supervised bail might just tip the balance in favour. And some sheriffs are more, kind of, are more amenable to, to things like supervised bail. But someone who has a terrible record for violence, in my experience, wouldn't be assessed as suitable for supervised bail anyway. OK, thanks. And Ben. Thank you, Convener. Before asking a substantive question, just Dan McMillan, I wanted to go back to some of the responses to... Mary Goujon's questions around uh, youth offending. I think the, as the MSP for Edinburgh North and Leith, there's, a, there's a f some difficulties that we have in this city, um, uh, particularly around dangerous and anti-social joyriding of, of motorbikes. And is that not a good example of how the community safety versus, uh, sorry, not versus, that's very adversarial, but uh, balanced with the, uh, the considerations around trying to, 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 to to use alternatives to, to remand is, is quite an acute example and, and I think quite a that's meaningful right. one. Um, that, I mean, antisocial riding of, of motorcycles has, in recent years has become a real problem um, and there are young people are appearing on petition for danger, like some horrendous examples of dangerous driving. Um, and yes, because they can be given bail so many times, but because at the point of bail, it's not like a post-conviction where sheriffs have got a lot of a lot of choices of community payback orders with various conditions, drug treatment testing orders. There's all sorts of options available to a sheriff post-conviction. There aren't the same as available pre-conviction. Um, now, that, that some of these young people might fall into the category of perhaps willful non uh, Compliers with court orders, which is a bit of a problem. Usually, they'll be given bail, and then if it, if 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 it happens again, they might look at a curfew or something like that. But and that an overuse of special conditions bail, I think, is one thing which might have something to do with increased levels of remand. But because but for example, a 17-year-old on a curfew is probably going to breach it, and then they appear for breach of curfew. And once you're appearing for breach of bail order, then you are much more likely to be remanded. Um, and the curfew 
I, I think if there was electronic monitoring, that would be one thing. But at the moment, it relies on the police to go round to the house in the middle of the night and bang on the door and check that the person's in. And they might have young siblings and mum and dad who've got work in the morning. So it's, it's a problem. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think that the antisocial behaviour is a, a problem that the, specifically in Edinburgh that we, we have with the young people. I just thought for the benefit of the committee, it might be worth others hearing that because it, mm. My experience as a constituency MSP relates to many of the point, yeah. points that you raised, so thank you for that. Um, going back to my sub, uh, substantive uh, question, convener, uh, note, uh, Professor, that you uh, very uh, pertinently say in your evidence that uh, offenders are likely to have chaotic lives characterised by combinations of alcohol and drug addictions, homelessness, unemployment and mental health problems, and that the court is in fact being asked to apply a criminal justice solution to a problem which, may, which many would see as a public health or welfare issues. Um, in similar vein to the question I posed to Sheriff Liddell in the last session, given, the, given that the committee has received evidence arguing that significant reductions in the use of remand would require action beyond the criminal justice system, for example, ensuring that general services are in place for vulnerable people. Do you, is that a position that you support or have anything you'd like to elaborate on? Um, well, I mean, personally, I would support that, but uh, I'm, I'm here to, to answer questions about the criminal justice system. And I, I think the criminal justice system still has to respond uh, to, these, to these people, that, um, to, to, uh, as you just said, to the, 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 the willful non-compliers. There has to be some kind of criminal justice. It's an order of the court. Um, <laughs> sheriffs would say, well, you simply cannot let people go on and on and on not complying with court orders. Mm -hmm. uh, so much as I would like to see as, as, as there are welfare solutions, I'm sure there are welfare solutions that would be around, there, there's still going to be a criminal justice issue to be decided as well. With more, uh, a wider focus on how the criminal justice system dovetails with those general services, if we're looking seriously at trying to um, reduce uh, the use of remand or, or uh, not granting bail, to put it the, the, yeah. the way the sheriff well, preferred. I, I'd go back to the point I made earlier, which if you look at the big picture, the, the jurisdictions that spend more money on welfare tend to spend less money on criminal justice and vice versa. Uh, so it's a question of shifting, you know, a cultural shift in the jurisdiction. And, and my personal opinion is that, 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 that the Scotland over the last I mean, I've been around a long time. And the last 10, 15 years, uh, th things, there are a lot of positive signs in Scotland. So I I'm not ne negative about this or, or, or pessimistic about the, the potential. These are very difficult problems. Uh, uh, but I think there are ways in which they can be addressed. It'll be a slow process, but uh, I'm not pessimistic about it. Okay. Thank you for that. And any other witnesses want to respond on that point? Or? No, I mean, uh, it's obviously part of a much more complex problem. And I'm already aware in a lot of judicial education, et cetera, the, the question of health and indeed, um, you know, has been linked into the question of poverty, which links into social welfare and links into all these problems. So I know certainly from my experience there that this is, these are aspects that are very fully addressed in, in education. And obviously education of the judiciary is one of the aspects that would relate to decision making and, and justification of decision making that you've been looking at earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our questions, but I just wondered before you go if there was anything we haven't covered that you might want to to um, say to the committee in, in relation to this whole subject, or have we really covered everything now? I just wondered if I could say something a little bit more about special conditions of bail. Yeah. Um, it, in recent years, generally, um, special conditions of bail are used a lot more um, often in the d domestic context, um, and I've mentioned curfews and the problems with, with, with curfews, uh, it's easy to breach a curfew. And once someone starts breaching mm. bail conditions, then their bail will automatically be opposed and they're unlikely to get bail. Um, as far as special conditions of bail and domestic circumstances are concerned, and Sheriff Liddell mentioned that there's often um, somebody from EDAX in the court who can give a, a bit of information about that. And, and often it will be entirely appropriate to impose special conditions of bail in domestic abuse cases. But there are cases where, 
I think the Procurator Fiscal will automatically ask for special conditions of bail in any in, in most cases, but if I'm just using domestic abuse cases as, a, as an example. Um, and sometimes it's a situation where a couple have been married for 25 years, they've got children, they both work, say the man's the offender, um, and he has no record, um, he has a job, and he appears from custody, and he's, he's told by the solicitor, you need an alternative address. And he might think, well, where, I don't have anywhere to go, but he'll probably think, oh, I'll go to stay with my mum or I'll go to stay with my friend. So he'll give another address. Um, the conditions will then be imposed. Now, it could be, if it's a serious offence of violence, then ab absolutely. But it could be a situation where there has been an argument it's got out of hand, a neighbour's phoned the police. And all of a sudden, both the, the male and the female are in a situation where the, the man can't contact her, he can't go home, he can't get his clothing. She, she's maybe thinking, well, I didn't want this to happen. I just wanted, to, I just, it was an argument. And then, so she might text him and say, look, just come round and we'll sort it out. So he goes round and the neighbour phones the police and he is, has breached bail. And then it becomes a situation where bail will be opposed. Now, this is from somebody, for somebody who basically has no record. He might have a good job. He might be the breadwinner in the family with children. And I think that that sort of situation can cause an awful lot of problems um, because sometimes um, if, in a, there are situations where people breach bail and absolutely they should immediately be remanded. But sometimes it's not as simple as that. But I think because of certainly policy issues in Crown Office, bail will be opposed if you breach a special condition of bail. Um, and I, I, it would be nice, and sometimes the, the complainer, it could be the lady, it could be a man, might be in court and might want to speak to the procurator fiscal and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want this. Um, but nobody will speak to her. They're, they're, and, and even if they do speak to her and, she say, and she's quite clear that she does not want this situation to happen, they won't listen because it's public interest, which a lot of the time, absolutely yes, mm -hmm. but sometimes I think it's maybe a little bit unnecessary and it can cause people who shouldn't be getting remanded to be get, getting remanded in custody. I think we came across the same problem when we, we looked at the Crown and Procurator Fiscal that uh, sometimes where they would maybe like to use their discretion for some reason they don't feel able to that and is. It, it is something in the context of remand that we can also keep in mind and carry I forward. Think, I think that's definitely, a, a, if the Procurator Fiscal felt they had more discretion I think that would have a, a, an effect, that's just my personal view, yeah. but I think it would have a, an effect on the number of people being remanded. That's very helpful. Anything else that anyone would like to add? Um, yes, Ms. very briefly. I mean, I obviously reflect in the 2016 Act, which we understand is reducing the number of custodies at the moment. Now, whether that continues, but I think it will be interesting, the work of your committee in this area, to look at the effects of things like investigative liberation, etc., mm -hmm. as that goes forward. So I would just mention that point. The second is uh, to endorse what's been said about addresses. That was one of the problems, certainly, when I was a deputy fiscal of the fact you've got to have a bail address yeah. and what are you going to do about it in a busy custody court if there isn't an address readily available the cases were continued without plea to the following day to try and get a bail address and I would hope that that's not such a problem as it used to be but it was certainly one reason I would say that we had to oppose bail because we didn't have an address and the third thing is I reflected again on this English and Welsh report and I think there are just one conclusion that I would draw to the committee's attention. It says, uh, in the same courts, depending on the particular day of the court hearing, this is talking about the practices, it says there's a lack of sufficient bail hostel places, lack of routine monitoring of compliance with certain bail conditions and timely reporting of breaches. And that was tied to the consistent provision of information. So that was some, the, these were some of the conclusions, and I will obviously send a report in that might be useful because they seem to reflect much of what your discussions have been today. That, that would be helpful. Just on the uh, bail address, did you, did you say or someone say in the past SACRO could provide uh, an address yeah. before and that's no longer the case? Yeah, that's no longer the case. And I know that in Glasgow they had the Hamish Allen Centre, which was essentially a bail hostel, which is yeah. still there, but it's just a homeless accommodation now. So the court where the social worker could get addresses for people who bail, if bail was only being opposed because they didn't have an address, that's not something that we have anymore. And I think that would 
make a difference. If, the, if there was. That's, that's helpful. And anything you'd like to ask, Professor Arthur? Well, can I thank you very much? That's been an excellent session. Thank you all for attending. We'll now suspend. Uh, oh, no. We now move into private uh, session. And our next meeting will be on Tuesday, 20th of March, when we'll take further evidence on remand. So I now suspend to allow the witnesses to leave and the public gallery to clear and to have a five-minute comfort break. <laughs>